Sometimes students who are enrolled in my course on critical media studies will look at the syllabus, I'll look at the schedule and look ahead and say, wow, we're talking about erotic analysis. This really is a college, a college class for adults, right? We're talking about erotic things. And, you know, and that brings to mind a certain type of media, of course. But the truth is we're not going to be talking about that kind of erotic material necessarily, although it is erotic. You know, in a different sense, we're not going to be talking about adult type pornography and things like that as part of this video or, you know, in my class, that's not really where we focus our discussion. However, we do have a, a section on erotic analysis, and that's what this video is going to um, describe and discuss how we uh, incorporate erotic analysis as a framework for critical media studies. So let's start by just examining what is erotic analysis? So erotic analysis examines artifacts in relationship to the sensuous, transgressive and productive pleasure exhibited by the audience. So, you know, erotic really just means pleasure. And we've we, has taken on a connotative meaning of, you know, it's closer to pornography or something like that. But really erotic just means something that gives us pleasure in any sense. So we're going to take a look at those aspects of erotic analysis and how that relates to our examination of critical media studies. Okay, now we know what erotic analysis is. Let's take a look at some of the major premises here that are involved in uh, in erotic analysis and some of the things that form it. So um, first, our, our first uh, major premise or concession is that people engage with media that brings them pleasure. There's a reason that people engage with media, and it's because it brings us joy, brings us pleasure. It's the things that we enjoy, right? So um, people are going to engage with things that they like. Oftentimes, there are things that we like that uh, that all of us like, right? That are immensely popular, that everybody gets behind. Sometimes it takes a little more time, but but uh, but there are t shows that uh, and and artifacts and and things that people just really enjoy and that we all get behind. Um, other times, and so and then we try and copy those, right? There's a reason that there are 45 different versions of NCIS and and that they all kind of work the same, just in different locations. It's because people know them, people like them, they're popular, so we want to repeat it and just try and you know kind of copy it in in a similar way so that people will enjoy that one as well. So but because we know people follow what they enjoy, that people are going to watch and, and take in media that they enjoy. Sometimes we kind of go against that with what we call transgressive pleasure. Right. And this is pleasure that that derives its pleasure from breaking with convention, from doing something that's different um, when we enjoy things that are different. So, again, people enjoy Norman Rockwell paintings. It's very familiar. It's very popular. It's very, you know, kids at the soda shop here is very um, it, it's very relatable. And so people enjoy that. And it's it's widely popular. It's intended for a mass audience. Right. But we also get pleasure from things that are very, very different. So at the time. Um, this was kind of the standard. This was, you know, the norm. Uh, but then you see somebody come along like Andy Warhol with pop art. And this is just so different. It's it's so unique and, and different that that's what we that's what brings us pleasure from it, though, is that it's so different. We like that it breaks with convention, uh, you know, or, or Jackson Pollock here. He wasn't trying to appeal to a mass audience. He's saying, I don't want to be Norman Rockwell. This is different. I want to express something different than what is expected than what is popular uh, at the time. So um, so you have the transgressive pleasure in that way. We see transgressive pleasure in in modern media as well. Uh, one example that I would uh, give you is the show Seinfeld It's a little hard to imagine because it is immensely popular now. But when it especially when it first started, Seinfeld really struggled to get off the ground. I mean, there was no uh, the first couple seasons were really short because NBC didn't want to order a lot of episodes. They didn't have a lot of faith in it, really. Um, so they didn't think it was going to make it. And so they only ordered a few a handful episodes and it, because it was so different. It's just so, so different. I mean, it's literally a show about nothing. That was their tagline. It's a show about nothing. It doesn't have these heartwarming moments. It doesn't have a, some sort of purpose or meaning in it. It's just it just is what it is. It's just these people in these situations and, and here's how it went down, right? I mean, they did an entire half hour episode in the lobby of a Chinese restaurant, you know, just waiting to get seated. What, what is that about? There was no purpose there. I mean, I, it's relatable to me. I, I hate waiting in those areas, but still 
it was different for the time when every every show had to have a you know a special episode where where people were learning lessons or people this show said no we don't want to teach anybody anything or really you know try and make a statement about anything we just want to tell these stories that happened to us and that and that we think are funny and that, that was really different and we we derived pleasure from it because it was so different and really changed the whole genre you could say the same thing and more recently about the office it's immensely popular now i mean it's been viewed so much around the world that it's hard to imagine that this was ever not the norm that it broke with convention but it can very early on this show was always in jeopardy being canceled they had really short seasons because uh, once again nbc nobody there uh, very few people were behind it didn't think it was going to be successful um, which again hard to imagine now but this was so different the mockumentary format and just the different you know, kind of the anti-hero with, with Michael Scott, especially in the first season or two, not being incredibly likable. He's kind of a kind of a jerk at times, kind of a doofus. But, um, but so it was really just so, so different. But that was, I tell you, as an early fan of The Office, very exciting for me as well to to be able to say that I was a fan of something that is so different. And it felt kind of like the secret that was just ours. Right. And that was really exciting. So we, we, we derive pleasure from things that are normal, but we also derive pleasure sometimes from things that break with convention that are, that we sometimes enjoy things even more because they break with convention and because they're different. Another significant avenue of pleasure for us is productive pleasure where we gain pleasure from creation, the process of creation. Uh, again, we talked in a, a, in a different video on ecological analysis about how we are, we live in a prosumptive society now, right? Where we are not just consuming uh, media, but we are also producing it. Each of us really is producing it in some way. And that's always been the case. It hasn't always been available in a mass format like it is today. Everybody now can really release it to the masses and, and find, uh, find an audience there. But, you know, I, I love uh, being productive. I love uh, creating things. I, I play guitar. I'm awful at it, but I love doing it because it's creative and, uh, and I love writing and I love, you know, doing these things. I, I, I get a great deal of pleasure and I do these things because of that, but I get a great deal of pleasure from creating these things. Now it's not everything. I don't get a great deal of pleasure from painting or writing poetry or things like that. Those aren't really my thing, but, um, but I, you know, I, so I pursue those creative activities though that bring me pleasure. Um, and so um, we have this kind of productive pleasure that we can find. You see it very commonly in um, things like fan fiction. So when you have people writing a you know a story about, well, what if Spock and Kirk had a baby? And what if uh, Harry Potter and his crew were in the Star Wars universe and were Jedis as well? But uh, so you, you, people get these creative itches and, and they, they um, find pleasure in these things, enjoy them. Um, so they pursue them, right? Even if they're never going to find a, a wide audience, um, which does happen on time. At, from time to time as well, though, um, the most famous example may be um, Fifty Shades of Grey. That whole universe really started as fan fiction surrounding the, the Twilight series. Uh, E.L. James was a, was a you know, really big fan of Twilight, and so she started writing fan fiction about those characters and about that world. And once they started getting popular, then she kind of transitioned away from, oh, she changed the characters' names and things so it's not set in that world anymore and wouldn't be in conflict in terms of copyright. But it really started as fan fiction uh, around the Twilight series. So, um, uh, so you see some of these uh, that, that do take off, but all of us really, we, we do things because we find pleasure in them. We engage with a media that brings us pleasure, whether that's because it's it's mainstream or because it's different or because we're finding uh, pleasure in creating and producing within that media. We can also look at what we call transgressive texts, transgressive texts within um, erotic analysis and looking at pleasure. So we, 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 there are two kinds of transgressive texts, really. Um, the first are what we call readerly texts. And these are kind of the captain obvious of, 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 transgressive text uh, because the the meaning of them is very surface level whatever that artifact is uh, whatever that person is trying to say or or accomplish is right there on the surface there's not a lot of you know hidden depth behind it i mean for the most part uh, you, you can assign some 
to these things, but, uh, but you know, Jaws, one of my favorite movies, Jaws is really just about a shark and about scaring people and about, you know, having that thriller sense and leaving you on the, the edge of your seat, which it still does. I mean, there's not, you know, is there a deeper meaning there? I don't, I don't know. I've never seen it. It just is what it is, but I love it. I love it. That's a very readerly text to me though. The, the meaning of it is, uh, be ready to be scared. And this is about a big shark. And, uh, so, you know, I'm thankful that I live in Indiana and we don't have sharks here because I'm irrationally afraid of sharks because of that movie. And that's the whole purpose, right? I mean, that's, that's what is, it's not intended to scare us, but it's, it is intended to scare us, but not make us wholly fearful of these. Anyway, so that's a readerly text, something that, that you know, the reading, the, the meaning is obvious. We also have what we call writerly texts. Writerly texts are a little more subtle. They have some subtext there. The meaning of it, it may not be right there on the surface and the, and the, and the author or where the creator slips in some little clues about what it's really about and, and is trying to send a message or trying to make a statement, trying to accomplish something with that. That's what we call a writerly text that has you no, know, those different layers and a little more depth to it than a readerly text. So just to compare and contrast from my world, um, again, to, to give you an example, um, I love the show 911. I love it and have for years and, uh, and I love it for just what it is. You know, there, there's some, you know, plot lines and things that, that go a little deeper, but really it's a show about there's an emergency and for me, the wilder, the better, but there's an emergency and these people have to try and figure out how to help that person out of it. It's about, you know, trying to save people, trying to keep people from getting harmed and, and how, how they operate and how they do this. I just, I just love it. I don't know that there's a lot of subtext there though. It just, it is kind of what it is. I mean, it's right there in the title, 911. What are you going to see when you call this? You know, and it's, it's going to be crazy. So you kind of know what you're getting into. That to me is a very readerly text. It, it is what it is. And it's very good. It brings me a lot of pleasure, uh, but it, it's not, to me, there's not a lot of depth to it. In fact, I kind of enjoy it for that reason. It's fun just to watch and kind of unplug and not have to think uh, about it in great uh, depth or detail. On the flip side, uh, my wife and I also greatly enjoy The Handmaid's Tale. And so if you, uh, no spoiler alerts, I prom or, there's no spoilers, I promise, but uh, uh, this is a really complex show, right? It's a really complex show with a lot of subtlety and a lot of hidden things like, like especially in the beginning, why are the handmaids all wearing uh, red and the wives of these powerful guys are all wearing green. I mean, what's the meaning behind those things? Why is it, when it's all color coded and what does that mean? And, and is this a message to us here in the United States? Is this a, you know, is this uh, supposed to be a forewarning about uh, if we don't fix things, this is where we're going to end up. So, so it's kind of a, there's kind of a political angle to it there or well as well, or at least a, a cultural or societal um, warning for some, some change maybe, so, but there's that. So you don't go into the handmaid's tale just thinking, oh, I'm just going to unplug and just let this wash over me and not really have to think about anything. Right? No, it's really complex. You got to look for these little things and really try and understand what's happening and what's the message. That is a writerly text. So readerly texts are right there on the surface. Writerly texts have more depth, more layers and, and require more from us, um, which is good at times as well. So it's a good, good for us to have some of both of those maybe. But so, so we have to be aware of those different types of texts and those different types of intention uh, behind the media as well. So what are some common questions that we ask as part of erotic analysis? Um, first, in what ways does the artifact represent transgression in its historical context? So again, when we think about Seinfeld, we need to understand that, I mean, when we look at it, it doesn't seem very transgressive, right? It's immensely popular. Lots of shows out there have tried to copy it and do what it does. So um, it's not really that different anymore. It's it's kind of mainstream. Same with The Office. It's, it's you know, they tried to copy it. They've tried to, the other shows have tried to do what they did. And so it's become very mainstream. So it's not transgressive now, but in their original context, when we place that in, in the appropriate time and place, those were both, as I mentioned, very transgressive. Um, they were, and they were transgressive pleasures, but, uh, so in what ways does this artifact represent transgression in its historical context? That's, that's the key there in its historical context. So, um, was it transgressive at that time or was it mainstream at that time? You know, kind of who was the first in essence, and those shows were both the first to do kind of what they did. Uh, is this artifact more readerly or writerly and why? Um, I think 
you know, again, Seinfeld is pretty readerly. I mean, they've been pretty clear about that. They didn't have any real goals behind it. They weren't trying to change the world. They weren't trying to, to send a message about anything. They were just trying to tell some funny stories, you know, and uh, is, is the, you know, the office kind of the same thing? Was it, is it more readerly or writerly? I would say it's, it's, it's definitely more writerly than Seinfeld. Um, whether or not it's entirely writerly, a lot of it is right there just on the surface too. Um, but there are some, you know, some subtle things in there, I think some layering in there. So it's more writerly than Seinfeld, but it's certainly not as writerly as like Handmaid's Tale or something like that. So, but we can examine, is this more readerly or more writerly and why? How does this artifact invite productive interaction with the audience? So does this, does this artifact really, has it, has it created and does it, does it lend itself to that kind of productive interaction where people, you know, in the 50 shades of gray thing where twilight inspired a bunch of people to do fan fiction and one of them just happened to take off and, and become 50 shades of gray. But does this artifact, I mean, are people getting behind it creatively? Another one of my favorite shows is, um, Firefly love that show. And you, people got passionate about it. People wrote storylines about it. People wrote, you know, fan fiction and, and really got engaged and wondered what happened. You see this a lot with, with a lot of science fiction, maybe because the fans are, are just creatively minded in general, but how much, how much fan fiction is out there about star Wars and star Trek and all of these science fiction things. Right. But so uh, how does it, how does the artifact invite that kind of thing? Uh, you know, does Seinfeld really invite a lot of productive interaction? I don't know. It may, it may have inspired people to do something because they found they could do something different, but I don't really that there, are, you know, is anybody else who can do really what Seinfeld and Larry David did with that show. Um, and subsequently, so, um, does it invite that or does it not, does it lend itself to that or not? What evidence exists of transgressive and productive engagement on the part of the audience? So how much do you see that? How much do you see people getting behind this because it's different? How much do you see people being productive around that actually taking place on the part of the audience? What evidence is there that, that those types of things are happening and that they're there? So it's just some of the common questions that we might ask as part of uh, erotic analysis. And, and as we look at how pleasure interacts uh, and, and is involved with our uh, viewing of that. So hopefully this gives you a little clearer understanding of what we mean by erotic analysis. I'm sorry if it was disappointing to some of you because it didn't get into where you thought it was going, uh, but it just simply has to do with pleasure. How do we find pleasure in these artifacts and, and in this media? How do we find pleasure in it? And does it produce pleasure? Do we, are, as a result, do we produce pleasure? Um, is it, is it uh, subtle or is it kind of surface level stuff? And just where's the pleasure coming from? And how does it, uh, how does it um, how, show up as a result of that? If you have questions about erotic analysis or any other type of critical media studies, um, please let me know. I'd love to hear from you via email and we can chat about it there. But uh, in the meantime, I hope this does give you a new sense of what it means to really um, engage with media uh, because of the pleasure that it brings and how we can look at uh, different artifacts and the way that, that, uh, that they bring pleasure or that they elicit pleasure on the part of the audience.